Hello, everybody, and welcome to episode number 304 of the Board Game Barrage podcast. And oh my god, this is one of my favorite episodes to do every year. This is the listener top 20, the much awaited, finally here. I'm excited to do it. So excited I didn't even introduce my co hosts. Hello, Mark. Hello. Hello, Kellen. Hello. How do you have that much enthusiasm for something you've done so many times in your life? <laughs> you know what's you know what's funny actually. People who've listened to this in previous years will know that this is a lot of prep work on my part. And every time it's rolling around, there's this like intense amount of dread of just like, oh my god, why do I agree to do this every single year? <laughs> but when I look at the results, I get fired up because I'm just like, how like hell yeah, you know, things change and things are moving around and see what people are like. It's 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 cool. I like analyzing the data and seeing like all the cool stuff that comes out of it. I also love that. Neilan doesn't fill us in on anything beforehand, so I love going into these blind and discovering, as the listeners discover, how things have changed and all the, the cool data tricks that uh, Neilan has concocted, so very excited. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll see how things have slid around this year, we'll see what's made it onto the charts, what's slid off of the charts, we'll have some guessing games going, some little facts and fun trivia based on all of Look the at submissions. This. Guessing games, fun trivia, I love it. It's when they describe the trivia as fun that you know it will really be so. (laughs) That is going to be in the second half of the episode, though. Before we get there, we are going to be talking about some of the games we've been playing this week. And this week, Mark is going to be talking about Shuffle and Swing. I'm going to be telling us about Mythwind. And Kellen will be talking about Cat Blues, the big gig. So let's start it off with Mark. Yes. So got a chance to play Shuffle and Swing. Kellen, are you more of a shuffler or a swinger? I do you can be both more dancing. Game. I do more dancing than either of you. Yeah, I used that's to true. blues dance for realsies. No, one hundred percent. So I would say I'm a swinger. Perfect, <laughs> love it. So you get and don't to... quote me on that or take it out of context. <laughs> uh, you get a chance to do both in shuffle and swing, uh, a game that'll be coming to Kickstarter before too long from Bitewing Games, who provided us with the review copy and a game that was designed by Robert Havakamian. Shuffle and Swing is part of a set of three games that appear to be part of this. Bitewing Kickstarter, along with the aforementioned Cat Blues, which is a remake of an older Kenitsa game, as well as Bebop, which is another design by Havakian. I wasn't f- familiar with Havakian's work, and in looking him up, these two games, Bebop and Shuffle and Swing, comprise two-thirds of the games he's designed. So he's new to the scene, but also according to his BGG page, at least, which who knows who actually did it, so hopefully he did, he's also a huge fan of Reiner Kenitsia, so that's a good sign. On it, he ranks his five favorite designers of all time. Five is Stefan Feld. Four is Kramer and Kiesling, which is kind of a cheat there, naming two for one spot, so I don't know. Three is Martin Wallace. And both number two and number one are Reiner Knizia, so <laughs> emphasizing his love for the doctor. I have a feeling the math might not be as tight with this guy. <laughs> <laughs> uh, he appears to be an economist, so how dare you. Uh, anyway, great taste in designers, but uh, will that translate into his own game design? That is the question. So in Shuffle and Swing, you play as mice who manage cats who build jazz instruments in a factory, vying to be the best mouse manager. So it's a theme that you've seen a hundred times before. <laughs> the way it works is, over the course of the game, you and your opponents will be primarily scoring points by a building together. So you're all sort of contributing to this. Three different instruments. There are a ne- number of different ones. They come in the the game, and you'll be choosing three of them to play each time. Each of the instruments are broken up into sections that are going to score when they're completed in their own unique way. So one instrument that you might choose in your setup might offer rewards in an area majority style, giving whoever built the most parts of that instrument the most points. Another instrument might give a point to everyone who's contributed to the instrument, giving a slight bonus to whoever built the most, and so on. So each one offers a different scoring method. You pick three, so you can presumably tailor the type of game you want to play based on the instruments you choose for each game. And so the game ends when two of the three instruments have been completed. So how do you build instruments or do anything in the game, in fact? Well, it's a dice placement via rondelle game. So what that means is there's a central rondelle where everyone will place their one pawn and you're going to move around the rondelle and visit one of the three sections of the board. Each of the sections are voted again to one of the three instruments that you selected for your game. Each instrument in turn has its own mini rondelle 
where you'll be selecting which action to take. And helpfully, there are only three possible actions that you can take at each spot. So let's go over the three actions really quick. So first, and the most common move in the game is, again, going to be to take the build action. But when you take this action, or any action in the game, in fact, you're going to be doing so by using a die that has been placed in that spot on the mini rondelle, be it your die or your opponent's that are on that specific spot on the board. So if I wanted to work on the horns instrument, one of the instruments you can select is horns, I would need to go to the horns section of the board and then use whoever's die was in one of the two build action spots for horns. You then take the action at a strength corresponding to the pips on the die. So a two pip die offers less options than the strongest, which is a four pip die. You'll take the action, in this case, building the instrument by placing your color pieces on that specific instrument board exhausting some number of cat workers that you'll acquire based on that section's cost. And then, as with all actions in this game, finally, after you take the action, you're going to increase the value of the die you just used by one and move it to the next spot on that specific instrument's rondelle, making the die more powerful, but moving it to a different one of the three different actions that are associated with all the different instruments. Also, I mentioned the cat workers earlier they are going to be using to, to take this build action. And whoever's die you use to take the build action or any action in the game gets one of these cat workers. This is how you accumulate more cat workers to take building actions. If you use your own die, you get the worker. If you use an opponent's die, they get the worker. So that's the sort of compensation they get for have, having you use their die, in addition to getting their die boosted up by you taking uh, their die for an action. Let's talk about the workers, these cat workers, really quickly, because... The second of the three actions you can take involves them. When you use workers to build instruments, which again is going to be the bulk of what you're doing in this game, you exhaust them by flipping them over to their exhausted side and their little like punch out pieces. So you flip them over to their exhausted side and place them on this quilt depicted on your own personal board. So each player has this little quilt mini board. This quilt is split up into rows and columns, each labeled one to four. And uh, if you take the ref refresh action, which is the second of the three actions in the game, you can select a row or column corresponding to that number based on the pips on the die that you select and take workers back from this exhausted quilt area to your active supply to use for building more pieces of the instruments. Finally, the third of the three actions you can take is one of the few ways you're able to score points in this game, which is to move the specific instrument's supervisor piece along the spaces of the instrument to show the work you've done on it. So what this means is each instrument will have this little supervisor mouse token meeple on it and if you take the supervisor action again one of the three actions you can take you move the supervisor along that instrument that number of spaces corresponding to the pips on the die and every spot that that supervisor visits whoever has built that spot on the instrument will get points that means you also need to keep an eye on players that are hoarding specific spots on the instruments. You want to make sure that no player has like a string of spots they've all constructed exclusively because if they do so and they use the scoring action, because they're all grouped together, they can make sure to score. So you're trying to do that yourself, like get little groups of spots on the different instruments to score in this way. But if you see somebody angling to do that, you want to like try to build something in there so that when they take the scoring action, you can get passive points by having the supervisor meeple walk past your building spot. So it's a way to, to both score passively, but also encourages players to keep an eye on what other players are doing. You're going to keep doing this until two of the three instruments have been built and the game is going to end. And then uh, you'll see some game end scoring that might be where you see some of Mr. Havakian's Kinesia Love shining through. Before I get to the game and scoring real quick, I need to mention there's another action you can get, which is mainly acquired when you upgrade your dice called bragging. I guess this represents bragging about the work that your team has done on the different instruments. So again, that thematic nature of the game really comes through. Anyway, each instrument has its own bragging track. And as you move up the instrument's bragging track, you're going to acquire little bonuses that help you break the rules of the game throughout the course of the game. Anyway, so let me talk about the end game scoring, which has a little bit of that Kinesia vibe to it. I mentioned the game ends when two of the three instruments are done. As you might have guessed, this means that usually, though not always because players get equal number of turns when the game is triggered, at least one of the instruments is not going to get completed. In that case, whoever moves up the bragging track the least, again, who's like ever lagging on the instrument that has not been built, gets negative points for every incomplete piece of the instrument. So it's something you need to keep track of, another thing you need to keep an eye on. Yes, maybe you don't want to move up on this bragging track on an instrument that isn't going to do much scoring. But you don't want to be the last person on that track, especially if the instrument is completely being ignored because 
that is going to come with it some major negative points. Finally, for the other two instruments real quick, uh, you're going to check for two things. One, how much bragging you've been doing on, on that instrument. And two, how many pieces you have uh, contributed to that instrument being completed. Whichever one you're lower on uh, is going to be de- determine the scoring you've done on it. So another little kinesi sort of like twist to it where you want to maintain a generalization of how you're doing your bragging and your building. You want to make it balanced because if you lag on either of them, your scoring is going to, to hurt. And that's basically what shuffle and swing is, is like. I enjoyed my play of it. The theme didn't quite grab me, but the art is lovely. The review copy that we got came with, I guess, an optional add-on, which includes the squishy cheese pieces, which were delightful and other nicer pieces. Delightful, but but certainly not necessary. I've only played it a couple of times at this point and would like to play it a bit more. And while I don't think it'll ever quite knock my socks off, it also didn't feel generic Yuri at all and allowed for some real moments of cutthroatedness which i liked though i think that the way that your group plays is going to dictate how that aggression sort of shakes out in one of our games we were playing pretty hands off each other we were you know keeping to ourselves but then toward the end of the game i saw one of my opponents sort of setting up his dice for a big action he he'd moved up on his die to a level four which is like again the strongest you can do and i could tell he was setting something up and in a game that had been otherwise pretty keep to yourself, I decided to jump in and use that die and sort of like scupper his plans. And mm-hmm. I think as a result, he had a, a bad time. But again, you know, I thought it was great. I love that kind of thing. It's not a game that, again, you need to play aggressively. I don't even think a ga- it's a game that rewards aggressive play. You just need to know that you can't leave your plans undefended. You can't just say, okay, I've got this lined up and this lined up and this lined up and it's all going to work out. No, you've got to know because people can use your stuff in this game that you can't just think that you're all set if you've got things lined up. A problem I did have with the game is the lack of clarity with the instruments in terms of how they separate segments of it and how they score. You know, I mentioned they all score differently and there's a Real lack of clarity in how the sections are delineated. Bywing has assured me that this is something that they are aware of and they're going to be tweaking it for the final version of the game, as well as a couple other accessibility and clarity tweaks here and there that they're working on. But anyway, a solid recommend for me for Shuffle and Swing. Again, review copy provided us by Bytewing Games coming to Kickstarter, I believe, April 9th. So shortly after this episode drops. Yeah. So if you're interested, check it out. And that again was designed by Robert Havakian and by Bytewing Games. One of the things I remember, I, I was sat next to a bunch of people playing this game for a, a chunk of time at Dice Tower West, and I remember it thinking that the board just looked very, very busy. Does that like contribute to like some of the readability issues you were talking about? Not really, because yes, the board has a lot of art on it that, that does make it appear busy for sure, but really, there is only one central rondelle. In a four-player game, there's only, what, there would be like nine spaces that you're moving on, so like... Even if it is busy looking, there's not like a lot of confusion about what you can do because there's only a handful of spaces to go to. And there are these like little flaps that are the instruments that you're going to be, again, choosing three every game and placing them around the edge of the board. And they, they also look busy. But in that case, the busyness does hurt the game. But again, because each instrument has its own scoring and its own shape and Things are just a little unclear, but again, Bytewing has, has said that that's going to be fixed. But the board itself, the business of the main board itself, doesn't really hurt because there's not really much to pay attention to in terms of like what you can actually do. I um, saw the cover of this game, and I thought, oh, there may actually be an uglier cover in 2024 than Sears Catalog. Uh, <laughs> but then I put them up side by side, and I just want to confirm that no... Sears catalog is still (laughs) Still uglier than Shuffle and Swing. But the board, like, I actually like the board presence of it does look like chaos. But then the cover, I'm like, I don't know how this cover matches what I'm doing in this game. And it's it's surprising compared to Cat Blues, which we'll get into, has such, like, lovely illustrations and art design in general. Who can say? So I want to talk about a game called Mythwind. This was also a review copy. Uh, and this is currently on Kickstarter, actually. Mythwind is a solo core cooperative game. Uh, I'll talk about a little bit of what that means in a little bit, or at least rather like what that meant to me. But the predominant word that gets used in their marketing, which I feel like is going to make Kellen coil back in horror a little bit. I don't know. I don't know why I feel like you just you just have negative associations with the idea of a cozy game, Kellen. How do you feel about cozy games? Terrible. 
<laughs> no, okay. So like Stardew Valley, like yeah. Um, can a board game be cozy? Can a board game be cozy? No. Mythwind is the attempt to answer that question, Calvin. I think Stardew Valley is a very good reference point here. They are very much, in a lot of ways, just making Stardew Valley the board game. Or, that already or exists. That already it does exists. Exist. Ironically, it does already exist. I've not played Stardew Valley the board game, so take that with you, as you will. But like, this is an attempt at that sort of genre. It is the, you know, for lack of a better word, the cozy video game. It is Animal Crossing. It's Stardew Valley, Harvest Moon, that sort of thing, where the process of just doing the busy work and getting slightly better at doing the busy work and the grind of it, the meditative nature of all of that. That's that's the game, you know? Life is found in the doing. Exactly. And more to the specifics of what that means in the context of a board game, there is no real long-term goal. There's no real tension. There's no real fail state like this. It's kind of just a game that is in the exercise of doing your role. Wait, so, so what is it? One. Does it just say, like, we're glad you're here? Like, uh, kind, goof around? Kind of. Kind of. It kind of really does. I mean, I'll come back to some of the specifics in a little bit. But there is, like, stuff you're working towards, but it's very much not the point, in my opinion. Okay, so to break this down, uh, in the base box, you have four roles. They are asymmetric roles, each, uh, like, a specific, like, trades person. You have a farmer, you have a crafter, you have a merchant, you have a ranger. And each of those is separate games, and if you're playing with multiple players, each player takes one of those roles. At the start of every day of the game, you have a couple of little things happen, an event, you're going to choose where on your little village, which starts off as this just board with face down cards representing this valley you're in, this uncharted land you're in. You're going to go about getting a couple of little resources, then everyone goes into their little private character game and this is actually intended to be done simultaneously so i'm doing the machinations of my character while you're doing the machinations of your character very little interaction in that process very little even understanding of what the other game is because this is highly asymmetric there are some similarities like there's some tie into like the action you took at the first start of the game that determines like what you're able to do on your turn but i'm just going to talk about this just for the sake of example from the perspective of one of the characters which is the farmer class so you are taking an action which might be plant a tile, and that's a little polyomino tile that you put somewhere onto your little board. You then might take an action that would be to tend to that plant, which would be to flip it over, make it more value. You might later down the line take an action to harvest that plant. There is some placement restrictions and where you can place these polyominoes next to each other. You are getting tools that you allow to like combo actions off each other. So okay, if I take a plant action and it's next to this tool, then I can also harvest another plant down, down over here. There's a little market row determining which plants you can plant. You're kind of just going through all these machinations, turn over, turn over, turn, in this very, very basic loop. Like I've almost ent- described the entirety of what the farmer's like game is, day over day over day. Planting new plants, getting them into the right place, clearing out new areas of your board that starts like very like sort of overgrown and then gradually clears out getting more tools and getting yourself more efficient, generating money for the intent of getting resources. The resources you use to communally build buildings. And this is the big drive of the game. Get resources, build buildings, unlock something new on your board, get a lovely little car that you put out somewhere into your valley, repeat the process, doing this in collaboration with your partner, trying to figure out, okay, well, we, we want to build this building next. What resources are we going to be trying to work towards? So you're going to try to collect money together, figure out the best way to turn that money into resources, and so on, repeat. That is really kind of the entire flow of the game. It is a process of getting better and better at the machinations of your specific character to the point that you're generating money faster and faster, day over day over day, in order to unlock more buildings and get new abilities and new things. There is also, in parallel to this, like an event, an action card, adventure card system that is adding little touches of the story. So as you can imagine from this style of campaign game, every now and again, you're picking up a card. There's a little bit of a hint of story written in it. There's a choice you might have to make. It's going to add new cards to the deck, add new unlocks, that sort of thing. But if this game has one big failing for my taste specifically, it is specifically that lack of an overarching like long-term goal. That sense of like, I don't know why I'm doing any of this. And the intent is kind of like I said earlier. The intent is what Kellen said really. The intent is the doing. It's wanting to just to go through the process that sort of, like I said, I actually kind of found myself weirdly enjoying just sitting down and doing this as an exercise in as much in the same way that you might build lego or build a puzzle it's just a process of doing that has like the slight trickle of a hint of like 
progress to it. The second biggest criticism I would say, though, is that progress is so strained and so slow. There is this sense that your character is getting better and better at doing the things. Like, I was actually surprised compared to, like, where I was with my farmer at the end of a couple of seasons versus where I was at the beginning of the game. Suddenly, you have your whole board filled out with plants. Every time you plant something, you're harvesting something and selling something in, like, a string of actions. There is some joy in that, but it's just so very slow to get to that point and the the worst part about all of this is that sometimes it just doesn't feel quite tuned correctly sometimes you'll look at like a tool or a skill or an unlock and be like i'm not going to work as long as it's going to take to unlock this because the reward is just not worth the benefit and that's kind of true of the buildings as well a lot of the times the buildings that you're actually working to the pivotal goals the big things you're trying to like get to and unlock the rewards for those are just kind of boring and dull and not really interesting or moving along the game in any meaningful way so it's kind of a game about making your own joy in it i play through all of the roles in the basic box just to get a sense of how they work they're varying degrees of good and interesting i wouldn't say that any of the decisions in that process are very compelling and that's largely because there are no stakes to any of this there's no fail state you're just making money slower if you're doing it badly you know there's no point where you'll be like well i didn't meet my season's goal therefore i lost progress or reset anything like that it just doesn't matter just start next season with slightly less money than you would have had you know so it's an interesting thing. I, I don't think it's for me. My hope is that by that description, someone out there will be like, yeah, that sounds like something I would be into. My reaction to this and a lot of other games like it is I would rather play the video game version of this. That specific process of just going through the tactile of the board game fiddliness works for me on some levels, but not to the extent that I would want to break this out constantly. I kind of feel like I've already had my fill of it. There's one character that was provided in the expansion that I haven't tried yet. I might just try that just to see how it works, but I don't think this is ultimately something I'm going to stick with. And the biggest bummer about that is it's largely because the long-term hooks just aren't there for me. The story is kind of cute in that sort of like fairy whimsical way but it doesn't feel like i have any real investment in it and i just don't know what i'm working towards in the long term if not that so you do mention that the play is not focused on an ending and sort of nebulous is there a ultimate ending maybe via like progression in the story that you're working towards is there some final goal as soft quote unquote it might be Yes and no. So so yes, in the sense that you can absolutely get through all the way through the event deck and just be like, okay, there are now effectively no more events. And, and you know, that would be a long way off. It's a pretty big event deck. But other than, hey, now I'm just not drawing event cards anymore, there's no rate reason to stop playing the story because it would take you ages and ages and ages to build every single building in the game. Okay. You know, that is the theoretical end. You've literally built every building. You've gone through the entire event deck. But that would be so far in the future that I can't imagine getting to that point. And so, but yes, once you got there, you you would be done effectively, okay. I think. And so you mentioned the event deck, which is presumably like a deck that is maybe shuffled or maybe not shuffled. Is there like a progression in the story through the event deck or are they just like one-off random events? And is there like a we're getting toward the I mean, I guess there is no big boss in this game. There's like there's no <laughs> there's no like yeah. confrontation at the end. But is, is this is this like a progressing story or is it just like a story based on the bits that you get in these event cards? It, it's a little bit of both. Okay. Every event you do, if there's a choice, it'll be like, OK, if you did this, then shuffle in event I cards da, 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 yeah. or shuffle in event cards. Da, da, da. So you're getting the rewards or, or at the very least the continuations of small little subplots. Yeah. But they're so slight. We're talking about like the, the smallest of tiny like hints of writing. Like every card is, you know, like a couple of paragraphs of text at best. And it's like, OK, you found a deer in the forest and its leg is trapped in the woods. Are you going to help the deer? Or, you know, like it's, yeah. it's that sort of no. very, very slight slight reward structure it's certainly not something i would consider personally very compelling it's just the flavor to the game more than anything and what delineates like the end of a play session i was going to ask you like what your play time was but i realized that when i was going to ask it i didn't even know like is there like a oh we've completed is it completing an event that is the end? it is completing a season which is nine well it's let's call it nine days which are basically nine rounds of the of the game you complete the season there are a couple of small things that reset not a whole lot to be perfectly honest and i would consider that to be one session of the game is playing nine rounds of it but it's kind of arbitrary enough that you can just keep rolling into multiple seasons or a season and a half like until you just like okay i'm done for now which actually does bring me to something i do want to talk about i do want to end on like one positive 
positive note, which is something I feel like I have to really call out here because the production values in this game and the way that it specifically works in the context of like saving and your progress and the way that the, the storage for all this works is actually one of the best I've ever seen in the board game. So every character has their own unique tray like little plastic tray that's both their storage and kind of their ui so they're kind of uniquely molded for each character to determine like okay if you're the polyomino player for example they're these nicely little molded grid that the things all nicely fit into and then at the best part about this is any point that you feel like you want to pack this whole thing up there's very short instructions for okay put the cards into this slot put the things into this slot then just put the plastic lid over the top and everything about your current state of the game, your very complicated polyomino layout is just perfectly preserved, flat by this oh, lid. Good. I should have brought it in here just to like literally show you guys, here's my progress in this tray. I can now flip around the room, you know, without fear of the contents getting spilled. You just pack all those trays together into the box and everything is just like perfectly preserved. I'm looking at pictures on the BGG page and it does look like a very slick, nice, well thought out production for sure. Yeah, and, and the thing that that actually lends to, which I think is also very clever, again, quite clever, is that if I finished one season and wanted to play the next one, I pack up one character and switch to a different character. It encourages you to just switch from role to role to role, from like session to session to session, because it just so effortlessly saves and restores from one character to the next. It's a really, really lovely idea. I do think the art is lovely throughout. I just wish it was a game that I was more invested in. Yeah, I mean, I can see for people who, and I've never played Stardew Valley, the video game, but who want that sort of meditative game experience where they're just like working on their own thing, that it'd be a good fit for them, especially if, as you said, like the, the UI and like the storage is done well. But I've also got to say, like, even for me, who's become more interested in solo play and this game sounds like you do solo, this sounds like the antithesis of what I'm looking for in a game. I, I it, it's, yeah. It's not for any yeah, of us. Yeah. I can't stress that enough. Like it, it's most for me. And even I am yeah. like, ah, this is not exactly what I want from my solo experience. But yeah, it's certainly very interesting. And I, I, I can't stress that enough. It's one of the more innovative ideas for a board game. It doesn't feel like quite anything I've played. And, it, and I hope that description one way or another will convince you whether it's something that you, you want or not. But not something I see myself sticking with in the long run. That is Mythwind by Open Owl Studios on Kickstarter right now. All right, I'm here to talk to us about an actual game, uh, and that actual game is Cat Blues colon The Big Gig. This is a redo of an old Reiner Knizia card game that has already been redone, but it has re been redone again by the dentists of Vitewing Games. And this is a tight, I want to say swingy, is an auction game by Reiner Knizia where you are collecting sets of cards, cards from one to five, you are putting out a sort of an array of cards and then everyone will be bidding on those in an auction format. The auction is intriguing in that one card will always beat two cards and three and two, but you can bid either different cards, as in you could bid two cards and those cards are a one and a two or a one and a four, and then two of the same cards would beat a bid of two different cards. So two twos would beat a one and a two or a one and a four, and then you could bid three different cards or four different cards. So the way in which you auction is already minorly unique. And then if you win the auction, you pay all your cards, and then you are trying to make quartets or sets of four cards. And the only time that you can play a, a quartet into your tableau is when you have won an auction. And why would you want to make quartets? Well, two reasons. One, you're scoring points equal to the rank value of that quartet from one to five. And in addition to that, you are getting that I completed the four quartet chit. And over the course of three rounds, you will be trying to get the most of those chits, the one, the two, the three, the four, the five, and the joker, in order to win a bonus of up to 10 points if you have collected the most of the different types of sets. The game each round is 20 points, meaning if Neelan turned in a five and a four set, that would be nine of the 20 points for that round. And then things would sort of reset themselves after 20, which is quite spiky in terms of, oh, the round's about to end. In addition to that, there are jokers. And the jokers are quite painful. You can use jokers in your bid, or you can use jokers to make quartets, but the player who has used the most jokers each round actually gets negative points. I believe it's negative five yeah, I think points. Right. 
that's mostly all the rules. It sounds, uh, honestly, even describing it, it sounds more straightforward than it actually plays. I find that this one has some of the most interesting turn-to-turn tactical decision-making that I have seen in this light of a rule set in a long time, which is to say that you can play, and I've played it maybe five times now. There are times where you don't even want an auction, but the sort of just getting more cards than you put in, you know, you're like, oh, I can win this auction with two cards and there's three cards here. And so sometimes you're playing the auction just to improve your own economy for future turns versus even trying to collect the cards. You're competing across those sets. You're caring desperately about the jokers. And you're also caring a lot about where you're at in each round because if you're at the end of a round and you turn in a set of fives, you might end the round, but you're not going to score points. You know, there aren't bonus points available. When those chits are gone, they are gone. You guys have both played Cat Blues, Colin, the big gig. What is your hot take on this Reiner Knizia game? I did, like you said, I felt like it was a unique way to do auctions. It's almost like using the shedding game values or value system in an auction yep. format is, a, is sort of a unique spin. And the way that jokers can be so valuable to make something happen to allow you to win a bid, but yet they stick to you as a permanent or at least permanent for that round negative that you now you have to keep an eye on and try to make sure that you don't have the most jokers played. So there are a couple of like interesting points of tension and thinking about auctions in a different way that that I enjoyed. I've played this three times, I think, and I've enjoyed it each time, although a couple of times there was a player, I think in two of my games where they felt like they were out early and they had less of a great time and uh that player was me <laughs> in one of our games and that did not feel great yeah. uh i i that i did like the game i i do actually like the game uh, a fair bit but i i do think that there are games where that happens yeah. and that i think that happened to kellen in the second game of it i played where you just kind of feel like you're just unable to make progress or headway and you are you find your point margin like a wide gulf compared to other players that are just able to like make it work and that just that happens it, it just seems like it's one of those games where that happens it doesn't necessarily do anything to help or hinder that from happening and you have to be okay with that it is a fairly light game at the end of the day so it it didn't bug me all that much yeah i will say that's why i emphasized like from a turn to turn i find the like sort of choices i'm making so intriguing but then on sort of a more macro level i sometimes question some of the situations that i have gotten myself in and like whether it's the result of my poor play or just like stupid happening in the game but 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 you know this is a small box card game right it can be explained really easily and it's not a trick-taking game right full stop that's good that's exciting you know i feel like this game will be in my bag for the next year in terms of just short small card games bust it out could play with four and it, it isn't like oh Nealon scored three points in the first round. I scored four, and Mark scored six. It's no, like, Kellen's got 12, <laughs> Mark's got six, and Nealon is f- And, like, that is fun. And you can see at the end the changes they've made, and I think they made strong changes. Again, I have not played the old versions of the game. But you can see why people will bounce off of this. But at the sort of 30-minute card game filler that it's playing in, um, I was... Uh, uh, I almost said I was enchanted with it, but I've never been enchanted by anything in my life. <laughs> I enjoyed Cat Blues, semicolon, the big gig. This was a review copy from the publisher, and I only regret that there is no colon on the actual title on the box art, and that it is only on BGG, so minus one point, five out of ten. So before we get to the top 20, Mark, you had a couple of things you want to call out for the listeners. Yeah, just a couple of things. First, I wanted to, I know we mentioned this on a previous episode, we have, thanks to Elongated Muffin, who is a user on our Discord, we have a map that listeners can go and sign up to be a part of that shows where listeners who are looking for gaming groups or looking to get together to play games are located around not only the country, but the world. And so if you are a listener and want to potentially reach out to other listeners, you can go to boardgamebarrage.com slash map. And if you want, you can fill out that form and see if there's any 
other BGB listeners around you that are potentially looking for gaming opportunities. So I thought that was a fun thing to amplify. And again, thank you to Elongated Muffin for setting that up for us. And also, I just wanted to mention, again, in the spirit of getting more games played, this time electronically, for those who are interested in playing games on BGA, and BGA has been releasing a ton of new interesting games recently. I've got games now going of Fromage, which is a new worker placement game about making cheese. Terraform Mars is now there. Glass Road is now on BGA. So a lot of really interesting games now available on BGA. Lancaster is there. The Woggers will be happy to hear that. And if you're interested in playing those, you can not only go to BGA and play them, but you can go to our Discord channel, Digital Tabletop, where you'll find people all day long putting out invites to, to various games. And it's just a really fun, vibrant community. Again, people are putting out game invitations all day long. So if you're looking to play something um, asynchronously, usually asynchronously, but also real time. And so you can, you know, take a turn every day and just, you know, have a game going on in the background. I think it's a fantastic resource. Kellen is shaking his They head. are putting out all day and night in the channel. <laughs> Shuffling and swinging. So you can find out for yourself by going to our Discord at boardgamebarrage.com slash Discord and going to our digital tabletop channel. And yeah, so I would encourage people who are looking to play more games, be it in person or digitally, to try out those two resources. Okay, let's get into... The listener top 20 for 2024. I think I've gone through this process a lot of times before, so I'll keep it brief. We sent out a request to have everyone submit their top 20 favorite board games. We got hundreds of responses. We got hundreds of responses every year, and it is a feat. Let me tell you, it is a feat to collate all of that data into something that is usable. This was the best year yet for something that was an easy process to work through because I insisted on everyone just copying and pasting <laughs> the names from Board Game Geek. Even then, we had some issues. I want to call those out because some of them were funny. Thank you very much, Nathan W. You know who you are for submitting Terra Space Forming Mars and also for submitting The Crew Quest for Planet Number 9. <laughs> And also for submitting Lord of the Rings colon journey apostrophe S in Middle Earth. None of these copy and pasted from Board Game Geek. Thank you to Sean Jacobson and Dylan for somehow both submitting Pedal to the Metal. Pedal to the Metal. Not that a uh, We threw that out. Right? We threw that. Yeah, those words are thrown out, right? Don't yeah. call people out for spelling errors, Neilan. That's rude. They didn't follow my <laughs> instructions. Neilan. They were supposed to copy and paste. To they avoid this to exact the podcast. thing. Why are you insulting them? What have we always said is the most important thing? I also would like to call out Sulseem for trying to sneak into the club with Hansa Teutonic. Not a game. <laughs> and I want to congratulate Akshay for hurting Biblios' chances on this list for submitting For the King and Me as one of his favorite Oh games. my god. What, did, they also, did they also vote for Biblios? They did not. What? That one. Who is a this troll. person? That's yeah, that funny. is a troll. You're right. That is a troll. Okay, <laughs> let's get into it. Uh, the process for those that don't know, I take all that stuff. I score it based on how high it is on your list. So how, games that you submit higher up on your list are more likely to affect the score of a given game. Every game gets a score through a magic formula, and we now have the top twenty for 2024. Okay, let's just start from the bottom here. I'm going to call out sort of interesting information, like maybe previous ranks on these games based on previous years. Let's start with number 20, which I am very, very pleased about. This was previously 37 on the list. So a big shoot up. It's a riser. Quest for El Dorado. All right. 37 to 20. Love it. Great game. Great game. I wonder where that comes from, though. Why the sudden rise for Quest of El Dorado? Yeah, I, I can think of a couple of reasons. The one that comes to mind was the availability of the new edition of it that is not the Ravensburger version, the one that has all the lovely card art. That kind of just became like in vogue of people like ordering that and importing copies of that. I don't oh, know if that that's the entire reason, but certainly amongst our listenership, I feel like there was a big contingent of people on our discord that i feel like we're trying to get that new version which is just much nicer i did the exact same thing oh well, well in, also in terms of availability i know that i've seen it at target so i mean that's that true too. Only help yeah yeah number 19 this is a slight slide up from 22 last year is azul okay that's kind classic. of surprised me a little bit but it's better than quest for el dorado so good thing it's Agreed. above 
Number 18 is going to be, I'm going to just very quickly check this because I didn't pre-vet this. Oh no, this is going to be the one of two Rhino Knizia games on the list. This is Tigris and Euphrates is up from number 25. Okay. All right. I don't think people actually like this game. (laughs) (laughs) I, I get where you're coming from. I think it's one of those things that's cool to say you like. Yeah. I mean, it's fantastic, and it's yeah. really spiky, and you just, like, the best player destroys people most of the time. But I just, maybe I've seen one person playing it one time at a convention <laughs> in the last 10 years. Like, honestly. I do think that that specific thing is why people like it, because it, it is a very high skill ceiling on it. And I don't know why lack of playing conventions would mean anything, because, like, people always play hot stuff at conventions, you know? Um, but I, but I, I, agree, I agree with sure. you. I agree yeah, that yeah, it is, yeah, yeah. I agree yeah. that it is a game that if you say you like, it sort of burnishes your gamer cred for sure. I, I do agree with that. Have you seen anyone playing it ever in the last three years I, anywhere? Oh, well, I have not seen anybody playing it. Oh no, I mean I've played it a couple times, but I've I've not seen it like in the wild very often. But I will say that to harken back to my mentioning the BGA thing, uh, there are fairly often games of Tigris being thrown out uh, in the digital gaming channel. So. But but again, I agree with your general. No, I, I, there's no doubt that it's beloved. It's just an interesting situation yeah. with Yellow and Yangtze, the new version of Yellow and Yangtze that's coming, and then not like I don't know, not a lot of active talk about yeah Tigris. Number seventeen is very sad for me. This is slipped down from number eight. Is a feast for Odin. Hmm. Big drop. Well, I mean, relatively big, big drop. drop. Yeah, I guess not in the grand scheme of things, yeah, but still, still sliding point. down the list a fair bit. Sliding up the list slightly. This one also surprised me. I don't think me. you can slide up, Neil. It's the second time you said slide up, and I just do not agree. <laughs> you can slide up. Now. What are you talking about? Yeah. Why really? can't you slide up? You what were you say? Sliding means coming Slinking down. Slinking up the list. So what do you do? Climb. Up? You, How climb. Do you, climb? you climb. Climbing. Climb up. Why that would sounds you climb hard. Up? Ugh. Ugh. Why? Shoots why? and ladders. <laughs> do you ever slide up the chute? That's fair. Climbing the ladder that is our top twenty up four spots from number twenty is terraforming Mars. Okay. I'm hoping that it climbs up my personal ladder because I'm looking forward to playing it on BGA. I mean, I had the same thing going on with Ark Nova where I, playing it a couple times in person wasn't a huge fan of Ark Nova, but getting a chance to, to dive into it on BGA has increased my estimation of it. So I wonder if the same thing will happen with Terraforming Mars because there are already so many fans of it in the first place. So, Yeah, I, I don't know. Like I, I've now played it a couple of times on the Alpha and BGA, and I, okay. it's still just a game that I find that I enjoy but just don't love. I enjoy the process of it a, a lot, but it's, I don't know, it just doesn't feel like special, special to me. Mm-hmm. Number 15, more or less in the same place, is Agricola. Nice. I like seeing that. Classic. Smart audience. And then climbing into the top 20, up about 10 spots, is El Grande. Wow. Okay. Reprint. Reprint. Yeah. Oh, is that why? Definitely yeah, that makes sense. Makes sense. Reprint. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Okay. You can buy it now, and it's more colorful, Mark. Yeah. yeah. And that's, I needed. that's why we're throwing away all of our big boxes into the trash for yeah. the new version that's superior in every conceivable way. <laughs> This is another one that surprised me. Another big leap here. This is up from 30 last year up to 13 is PAX Premier 2nd Edition. Not sure what the timing on that signifies. BGA is implementation. Oh, BGA, of course. Of course. That's exactly what it is. Yeah. Yeah, actually, that implementation is very good in BGA as well. Yeah. Make some hot takes, Mark. PAX Premier, after now having played PAX Renaissance and PAX Porphyriana, PAX Premier is like the boring Euro brother Interesting. of other PAX games. So I need to play more PAX Ren because I haven't played it now in years and I know there's an implementation on BGA, so I need to do that. I will say that playing it on BGA, PAX Premier, I'm talking about now, I've still not played PAX Porphyriana, which is annoying, but playing PAX Premier a couple times on BGA has made me internalize the rules more, so I really like that, that I can just dive into a game and, and be ready to go. But uh, yeah, it does feel more Euro-y than my recollections of PAX Ren. Uh, it's are. still not like obviously yeah. it's on a spectrum yeah. of the PAX games, but yeah, yeah, you yeah. can like I can see why this would be the most palatable one, sure. and then the production is just so beautiful. Right? You know, right. like I like this game. It's not a, not a swing, just a slip <laughs> or a climb. Uh, number twelve is up from sixteen last year. Is Inish? I wonder. 
I mean, again, uh, this is a, a very minor movement, but... Uh... Yeah, oh, totally, totally. Yeah. yeah, it's also worth saying that, you know, that there is just something to be said for did the exact same people submit last year versus this year. They're, 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 yeah. It creates a little bit of fudge to the rankings, I think, is not going to always be, like, super perfect. Yeah. But yeah, more or less in the same spot, I would say, as Inish. Also, um, an, or just a, a bad call by our listeners in general. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, compared to previous years. Well, no, in, in general, to have it on our top 20, I do not like. <laughs> but go on. Number 11 is down one spot from number 10 is Race for the Galaxy. Okay. Like it. Appreciate that. That's a good one. I know that I've sort of hopped on about Race for the Galaxy enough over the years, but I this is the one I just won't ever get. But <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. Okay. Then this next one kind of, I, I'm very interested to get a little bit of a judgment call from you guys as far as like my process went here. So a little bit of backstory to this. Where possible, I usually combine editions of games where it makes sense. So everyone that submitted Twilight Imperium 3rd edition, I combined you with everyone that submitted Twilight Imperium 4th edition. In games where it's a little bit less clear, like Study and Emerald, I usually kept those separate. Although again, less of a problem this year because people were generally just copy pasting the edition that they specifically meant. Where this, I wasn't sure what to do in the case of Dune Imperium Uprising. Number 10 is Dune Imperium. I would have combined them, I feel like. If you combine Dune Imperium Uprising, it jumps to number eight. Okay. So we can do that if we think that that's the right call. What do you think, Kellen? Sorry, are we on the air or are we off the air? No, we're on the air, 100%. Uh, sorry. Well, sorry, you're just like, I'm like, whoa, what's happening here? Oh, you're there behind uh, Well, because oh, yeah, yeah. they can be combined, but like at that point, I do think a study in Emerald then should be combined, to be honest with you. Not yeah. that I care about like the rank of that or that it totally. would make it to the top 20 either, and, but like and for there what is a... For what it's worth, for cases like this and a study in Emerald, I always did the maths to be like, does this matter if I combined all of them? Yeah. And in study, for the study in Emerald's case, it didn't matter really. So but yeah, this is one it. where it did. Yeah. Cool. Uh, so yeah, I'll juggle this around mentally inside my head. So Dean Imperium is going to be number eight, which makes Concordia number 10. All right. Bad choice. A game that I feel like I want to get back to. I haven't played it in years at this point, but... You'll never play it again. I guarantee it. <laughs> Maybe one of the new maps. I've never played one of the uh, alternate maps. I'll give you $25 if you, next time you play it. I'll take a picture of it, and then I'll claim the 25 bucks. All right. If I'm not mistaken, this used to be number one when we yeah, first so. did the listener top 20. I want to just double confirm that, because this is the one that has definitely just been steadily sliding down the rankings since the first time we did this. Yep, Concordia was number one back in 2021. It is now a number 10. Number nine is slipping down as well from number seven is Castles of Burgundy. Justifiable, I think. Kind of surprising, maybe, considering it just had a fancy new edition, although I think that there was a lot of contention around it, I believe. Yeah. I mean, a solid game, but I, I just feel like a game that will always be solid, but generally should slip down in terms of like newer games that are coming out and evolutions in, in gaming in general. But yeah, always solid. Always going to be solid. Number eight is Dune Imperium, as we said, with all of Uprising folds into the mix of that. Number seven is up a bunch, which is very notable as you get this close to the top of the list. Up from 15 last year is Ark Nova. Okay. I wonder if it's the same thing that happened to me with BGA plays. I can and, see that. I know expansion. it also just had an expansion. Yeah. So the, and that expansion is very good for what it's okay. worth. Never yeah. played it. But. It's the furthest thing I would say is an essential expansion, but I liked all of the changes it made, so... Nice. Yeah. Number six, up from number nine, Kellen will be happy to see Innovation sliding wow. up the charts. Okay. There it is, everybody. The truth, the way, and the life. <laughs> <laughs> and the new version has not come out yet, right? The or has Yeah, it? but there was a Kickstarter, so maybe right. some interest in, I, I don't know. I mean, there's also just like, Innovation feels like it's been a little bit of a riser, you know, and I, and I think about other games just in terms of like they just sort of they're not bad or good. They just sort of fade away from consciousness. Yeah. From the sort of general group of gamers. Like I kind of think about that with Castles of Burgundy. Again, there's like literally nothing wrong with it. It's just no one's really talking about it, even in spite of a giant ass deluxe uh, yeah. Kickstarter. Then the biggest riser into the top 20 by a long, long way. This was number 49 last year. It is now number five. So this is something newer. Guess. It's got to be newer. 
I don't remember what was on the list last year. So that oh, you're saying it was forty? It was forty nine. So it, it didn't place in any previous year. Is it okay, within, to my knowledge? Is it a release within the last like two or three years? It's no. like okay. Uh, I was thinking it was going to be like Earth, but that had like a str- stratospheric rise and then like the no end. chance Earth is top five. I, no, I, I know, but it like it's the same people who like Ark Nova and terraforming Mars who are boring. So it could have <laughs> this been. is going to give it away probably, but it's the second and only other Rhino Knizia on the list. And it was four. I mean, is this raw? It's raw. Okay, so the new edition like. New edition, Bring almost certainly. Up. Like, yeah, I, yeah I, I, I mean, we saw this in what was it recently? The draft popularity that took us all by surprise, right? Like, there is a whole host of people okay. playing Raw for the very first time. Nothing wrong with last that. Year. Yeah, that works. I think that there's this idea, okay? If it like Raw is a classic favorite game, you know what I mean? And so when a new person plays a new game, it's like not only is the game really good. But then they look around and see that a bunch of other there's a bunch of other people who love raw, and that makes it really easy to be like, I love raw. Yeah, yeah. Um, and again, no shade to raw. I have the big edition like right next to my big head here, <laughs> but I do think that that helps those ones that are just like, oh yeah. And, and and to some degree, right? Innovation is probably helped by me just sort of saying that over and over again that it's like people get <laughs> on their first play, but. You know, people really love this game, you know, and that helps them like persevere and then it ends up in their top 10. Yeah, I mean, I think that's exactly it. Like, it's the perfect storm of things which is to say it's a classic game that, you know, like Tigers and Euphrates is just floating around in the consciousness enough. Uh, it's very accessible. It's very easy to play. I don't know that I played Raw with anyone that had a tr- bad time with it. And then you have this lovely elaborate Except new Mark. edition. Except for well, Mark. For a uh, <laughs> right. For- and then you have this lovely, you know, elaborate new edition that has a bunch of like Kickstarter FOMO and stuff all tied into it. You know, like I, I think it's just the perfect storm of stuff that made it, it's going to make Raw shine this year more than ever. But yeah, number four is down a couple of spots from number two last year is Spirit Island. Okay, this is on a, t- a slow descent down, I would say. Yeah, amazing co-op, but just like fading from the consciousness. And, and you know what? Through no fault of the itself, I mean, it had a great run considering like how long people have been talking about Spirit. I think it's been like perennially just like beloved with multiple expansions for yeah. like so long at this point that yeah, it, it does not pain me to see it sliding down at this point. Swippy swapping with it more or less into number three from number four is Root. Yeah, makes sense. I mean, people who love Root, love, love, love Root. It's a very much a lifestyle sort of game. Number two is Hansa Teutonica. Okay, from what? From three. So just three. moving up one spot. Okay. Basically, yeah, Root, Root and Hansa Teutonica just occupying the space that Spirit Island had last year. And then number one remains number one is Brass Birmingham. And how did that break down with the other with Brass Lancashire? You know what? I didn't do that math this year. I, okay. I treated them as separate entries because I do think they're distinct enough that you can't reasonably combine them. But and also there would be no benefit to combining them. But Lancashire, I don't know where that place. I can. So I you're have saying that data somewhere. Give me so one what you're saying then is Birmingham by itself had enough to be first place. Oh yeah, without yeah without combining with Lancashire, Birmingham was still number wow. one. Yeah, I, I was going to say by a mile, but I would say that Birmingham and Hansatonica, their score is within. 10-ish percent of each other. So okay. it's, it's certainly it's still not like sizable. a mile. Yeah. yeah, And I could make the argument, I think, very easily that you could combine the two games. But regardless, that shows, obviously, the, the strength of Brass as far as the listeners are concerned. So happy with that. I'm happy with to see Brass reign supreme. So is Brass, Teutonica, Spirit Island was third? No, Root was third. Uh, yeah, Brass. Our top five is Brass Birmingham, Hansa Teutonica, Root, Spirit Island, and then Raw. Okay. Lancashire, for what it's worth, is 42 all on its own. Very interesting. Yeah. Happy to hear that. I would root for uh, Raw to rise a little bit, and I uh, wouldn't mind seeing Spirit and, uh, and Ooh, Root. I don't know. I feel like I think Raw is going to peak at five percent. Yeah, I agree. I think you're right. I think you're right. I think I think it's it, it's most hyped right now. But yeah. Uh, so what are the what are the, what are the big biggest risers? I know you've already yeah. So uh, yeah, I, I definitely have a lot of stuff there okay. we can yeah. get to. A couple this of things really quickly. Five games left the top 20. 
I don't think it's going to be worth taking a huge stab unless anything jumps out of mine that's like right off the top of the no. bat. But Gloomhaven slipped from five to twenty three, so pretty okay. dramatic. Not a board game. Gloomhaven. <laughs> <laughs> I think the Calvin's going to be saying that a lot right now. Scythe <laughs> slipped from thirteen to twenty seven. Okay, is that a board game? Yes. It's a board game. <laughs> Great Western Trail slipped from 11 to 22. I think there's a little bit of like futzing here, which is to say there are multiple editions yeah. of Great Western Trail, and I think people may have picked their favorites, which actually hurt its overall yeah. position. Makes sense. Uh, Food Chain Magnates slipped from 19 to 29. Yeah. Makes Wingspan sense. slipped from 17 to 25. Okay. Nothing super uh, surprising there. Yeah, definitely. One thing I thought was interesting is like the, the games that had the most entries at number one on people's lists and by that metric root actually takes it by a fair bit yeah, so more people that. had root as no, their number one game than any other game man we have smart listeners which also means then that there were a number of people who didn't have root very high at all right obviously yeah yeah exactly then yeah let's talk about some of the biggest changes here the, the stuff they fell out of the top 20 like some of those are the biggest ones raw i already called out is probably the the biggest in terms of like raising its overall position is probably the biggest riser in that sense but if you go as far as like the top 100 games the scores for these get a little bit dicier but the biggest fallers by a long way were cthulhu death may die clank and Blue Lagoon, sadly, which oh, all fell the... about 200 and something places. Wow. Okay. Yeah. I can see Cthulhu Death May Die because that seems like quite niche and also seems like it's a bit out of the consciousness. Uh, what were the other two? Clank and Blue Lagoon. Clank. I wonder if Clank, because of the ver- different versions of Clank, but um, there have, has there been any big Clank releases in the last year? I could just see it based on the merits of the game to some extent. I no, think that I space that, yeah. was novel, and then it yeah. got less novel as time went on. Like, the deck-building hybrid just became more and more prevalent, you know? I wonder if Blue Lagoon has fallen in the listeners' estimations when compared to other Kinesia. Yeah, games. that made me—I had the same thought. Like, Babylonia, I think, ate a lot of Blue Lagoon's lunch to some extent, yeah. uh, especially with our audience. And maybe the rise of Raw also meant a, yep. a drop of uh, Blue Lagoon a little bit. And then the five biggest rises on the list that, you know, that previously held were in the top 100, I should say, because that's, it gets, like I said, the, the numbers just get much, much weirder outside of that range. Yeah. But Raw is the big one, 44 spots. Scout went up 37 spots. Okay. Biblios, Woo! 35 spots. Woo! I love it. Wait, what? Tell, say that again. Say that again. I was not ready Biblios for that. Biblios is... Yeah. I don't know why I'm saying it so weirdly, but Biblios went up 35 spots. I Look at that. I Wait, to what? Have, it is now number 58. Okay. We're getting there. We're moving up. <laughs> love it. I love that. I love that. Age of Steam is up 33 spots. Okay. It is now number 40. And Blood on the Clock Tower is now number 26, Ooh. almost in the top 20, up 32 spots. Wow, okay. But like that's, that's... got to be another one that how many times does it appear on the list versus yeah. like for high sure. up? It's like in a bunch of people's top fives and totally. then no one else's list. And, and yeah, and for another very brief behind the scenes, some of the formula does try to account for that of like sort of blurring the lines between did few people submit this highly versus a lot of people submitted lower on their top 20 so there is some math that goes into sorting that out a little bit that i will never reveal uh (laughs) there is one new game as in brand new from 2023 to enter the top 100 okay any guesses hint hint hint. give me like a rhino kintia that's the malam it's not malam no Uh, what what other new is it my my city that's not that. It bad. is not my city. It is a remake of an older Knizia. We've all played it. Yellow? It is oh, yellow. Zuvadis. Oh, makes sense. Makes sense. Good. Yeah. Duh. Where is that? That is now number 66. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. I can see that rising too. Okay, then. I always like doing this. I think this is always a little fun bit. This is on all of our respective top 50s, the highest placed game that not a single person submitted <laughs> love this the pull most it. distasteful game that we okay. have in our respective Wait, top 50 i'm gonna pull up my top 50 because i don't i gotta i gotta guess this but the highest rated game that like we basically like the worst influencer award as well <laughs> exactly right despite how much kellen talks about x yeah. no one submitted no one a single entry anywhere <laughs> on any the of their f- up, kellen well we know it's not biblios that's all i care about <laughs> all right what game is high on our list doesn't appear on anyone's list 
Sorry, and it's the highest position on the highest position lists. on each of our lists. Yeah. So it's like, is there anything in anyone's top ten? This exactly. Fun, yeah. If if this was your number one game, then that would have been the one I picked. But you know, for what it's worth, you have to go down below, certainly below the top ten. But like, so it's nothing in the top fifty. Okay, I'll this is that not that a much. single out of hundreds and hundreds, maybe thousands of re- replies. Not a single person. Not a single person had this. Oh, anywhere I mean, I, on I know one of people. mine for sure. Okay, I'm going to take a guess. You wanna take a guess. Yeah, it? I'm going to guess. Tycoon yeah. India. Tycoon India was. Wow. Actually. Okay. 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 Neilan, I my pick is the orange tank in the fourteenth position with Watson and Holmes. Correct. Oh, good call. Wow. Okay, guess mine then. Guess mine. Oh, what your is there one? I mean, everybody had one, right? At least one. Yeah, everyone had one. Oh, oh. So okay, now. How well, no, sorry, not, no, no. Not everyone had only yeah. one, but everyone had. Yeah, I, yeah, I picked at the least one. So yeah. what's the highest one? Uh, actually, on sorry, let me. Load? I might just have to double back. Tycoon Ninja. I'm not 100 percent sure okay. about. Actually, it is. It's it's higher than that. Okay, though. let me just go down my list real quick. Ready? Biblios never. Agricola uh, never. <laughs> Estates never. Bus never. Brass never. Fresh fish never. Time up never. Marvel Champions never. Mister President. I'm going to say no, even though it could be. Arboretum no. Kalis 1303 never. Race no. Age of Steam, no. Raw, no. Lancaster, no. What are these people doing? Chicago Express, no. I, th- I mean, I guess it could be Mr. President. I'm going to say Mr. President. I'm it not- is not Mr. President. Yeah. I'm going to say... Oh, I know what it is. Mercator? What? It Mercator. is not Mercator. What? That was going to be my guess. For Kellen. Oh, no. So for, for yeah. Mark, sorry. It's not Mercator. Could it be Mercator and something else? Because it's uh, higher up. I mean, possibly. Yeah, again, yeah, yeah, you're right, sure. actually. It could, Mercator may well be, but it, that is not the highest one. I will just say, because we've basically got yeah. all of them in that vicinity, Tramways. Oh, wow, well, that surprises no me. No one cares for that surprises Tramways. Me. I think I, th- I felt there was enough people who really liked it that somebody would have it on their list. Okay, all right. I have a feeling like Kellens is actually going to annoy him. So. Oh, I love it. I love it. <laughs> it's, not, no, it's not that bad or anything like that. It's just kind of like, I, I think, I, I have a suspicion he's going to get annoyed by this, but I, lo- I love this. I can't wait. I mean, my first guess was, but Neil and your yours was higher, is what we're saying, or no? I oh, so we're all I, doing it independently. Got yeah, it. yeah, yeah. Sorry, uh, we, yeah, yeah, yeah. We're doing this independently. My, my guess would be I'm the boss. I'm the boss was submitted. For what it's worth, I think that was the case in previous years, but there are at least a couple of people who had I'm the boss this year. Uh, it was Fuji Flush, Kellen. Oh, uh, all these people suck. <laughs> uh, no, it's just out of it's really out of print, and everyone who's played it is delighted by it. And also, people have such a bias towards like heavier things. I think just that's enjoy exactly light it. things, and I think that's exactly why I figured like this would bug. Well, not buggy, but it's like yeah, because it, because it's a small card. Oh, game. it bugs me. <laughs> <laughs> I will say this: I do think we made new fans of Fuji Flush at the at the meetup. Um, yeah, it's fantastic. So next year, next you didn't year. even play it with me. The That's one true. who's championing it. <laughs> and you're like, oh, no one likes your influencer. <laughs> Thanks, Neilan. Uh, okay, then let's talk very quickly before we wrap up here. Uh, I also like to find the people who are most aligned with your taste. Uh, he's already had a mention earlier in the episode. Elongated Muffin is one of Kellen's two biggest fans. Okay. Yeah. And Frank and Sam is the other one. Come on into the club. Send me a PM. <laughs> Mark, your most aligned listener is Otisk, O-T-Y-S-K. Okay. Who is also the most aligned with BGB's taste overall. All right. I speak to the people. Makes sense. And then mine is a four-way tie between of Frank and Sam, is. Longtime Sunshine, S. Peter 22, and Gordita Crunch 93. Do you both share Frank and Sam? Both fair Frank and Sam. See, it's just it's just me and who is it? Just My, you and Otis. Me and Otis. Yeah, wait. One on there's one. a person who's a combination of Neil and I. <laughs> oh God, <laughs> how terrifying! <laughs> okay, who of the three of us is the most aligned with the audience taste? Mark. No, Neilan. 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 Who is second? Mark. Mark. Kellen. Kellen. Oh, Whoa! I'm the outsider. I speak to the unique. Mark, by a smidgen. By a smidgen. Wait, I don't like this. Yeah, you Can guys are both like the numbers. <laughs> you guys are let's both change, like. Let's change this. I don't want to be in alignment with anyone. <laughs> you guys share Frank and Sam. You guys, everybody plays your games. Boring. Exactly. I got all the unique stuff. Me and Otisk just doing our own thing. <laughs> <laughs> that is all I have for you. Thank you so much to everyone that submitted. 
at your lists. This is always so much fun to do. I, I, I love seeing the results of all of this. And a big thank uh, you to Neilan for doing all the work. I, I love this episode. Uh, you're so, welcome. Yes. You're yeah. so welcome. Fantastic. Like I said, it, it's, it's like a wall of dread every year, but I love what we get out the other side of it. So awesome. very happy to do it. And that is going to do it for the episode. Thank you all so much for listening. Thank you for taking part. Thank you, as always, to Heart Society for our intro and outro music, What's in Your Mind, Kid? You can find us in all forms of social media, whether that is Twitter, whether that is Discord. Come hang out and chat with us at boardgamebarrage.com slash Discord or join our Facebook group. That is going to do it for this week. Bye-bye, everybody. Goodbye. Bye. Bye.